This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information on how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.blogsome.com. My name is Jean O'Sullivan. The book, The Call of the Wild by Jack London, and this is chapters 5 and 6. Chapter 5. The Toil of Trace and Trail. Thirty days from the time it left Dawson, the salt-water mail, with Buck and his mates at the fore, arrived at Skagway. They were in a wretched state, worn out and worn down. Buck's one hundred and forty pounds had dwindled to one hundred and fifteen. The rest of his mates, though lighter dogs, had relatively lost more weight than he. Pike, the malingerer, who, in his lifetime of deceit, had often successfully feigned a hurt leg, was now limping in earnest. Sol Lex was limping, and Dub was suffering from a wrenched shoulder blade. They were all terribly footsore. No spring or rebound was left in them. Their feet fell heavily on the trail, jarring their bodies and doubling the fatigue of a day's travel. There was nothing the matter with them except that they were dead tired. It was not the dead tiredness that comes through brief and excessive effort, from which recovery is a matter of hours. But it was the dead tiredness that comes through the slow and prolonged strength drainage of months of toil. There was no power of recuperation left, no reserve strength to call upon. It had all been used, the last, least bit of it. Every muscle, every fiber, every cell was tired. Dead. Tired. And there was reason for it. In less than five months they had traveled twenty-five hundred miles, during the last eighteen hundred of which they had had but five days' rest. When they arrived at Skagway they were apparently on their last legs. They could barely keep the traces taut, and on the downgrades just managed to keep out of the way of the sled. "'Mush on, poor sore feets!' the driver encouraged them as they tottered down the main street of Skagway. "'This is de lass. Then we get one long rest, eh, for sure, one bully long rest.' The drivers confidently expected a long stopover. Themselves, they had covered twelve hundred miles with just two days' rest, and in the nature of reason and common justice they deserved an interval of loafing. But so many were the men who had rushed into the Klondike, and so many were the sweethearts, wives, and kin that had not rushed in, that the congested mail was taking on alpine proportions. Also there were official orders. Fresh batches of Hudson Bay dogs were to take the places of those worthless for the trail. The worthless ones were to be got rid of, and since dogs count for little against dollars, they were to be sold. Three days passed by which time Buck and his mates found how really tired and weak they were. Then, on the morning of the fourth day, two men from the States came along and bought them, harness and all, for a song. The men addressed each other as Hal and Charles. Charles was a middle-aged, lightish-colored man with weak and watery eyes and a mustache that twisted fiercely and vigorously up, giving the lie to the limply drooping lip it concealed. Hal was a youngster of nineteen or twenty with a big Colt's revolver and a hunting knife strapped about him on the belt that fairly bristled with cartridges. This belt was the most salient thing about him. It advertised his callowness, a callowness sheer and unutterable. Both men were manifestly out of place, and why such as they should adventure north is part of the mystery of things that passes understanding. Buck heard the chaffering, saw the money pass between the man and the government agent, and knew that the Scotch half-breed and the mail-train drivers were passing out of his life on the heels of Perrault and Francois and the others who had gone before. When driven with his mates to the new owner's camp, Buck saw a slipshod and slovenly affair, tent half-stretched, dishes unwashed, everything in disorder. Also he saw a woman. Mercedes, the men called her. She was Charles's wife and Hal's sister. A nice family party. Buck watched them apprehensively as they proceeded to take down the tent and load the sled. 
There was a great deal of effort about their manner, but no business-like method. The tent was rolled into an awkward bundle three times as large as it should have been. The tin dishes were packed away unwashed. Mercedes continually fluttered in the way of her men, and kept up an unbroken chattering of remonstrance and advice. When they put a clothes sack on the front of the sled, she suggested it should go on the back, and when they had put it on the back and covered it over with a couple of other bundles, she discovered overlooked articles, which could abide nowhere else but in that very sack, and they unloaded again. Three men from a neighboring tent came out and looked on, grinning and winking at one another. "'You've got a right smart load as it is,' said one of them. "'And it's not me should tell you your business, but I wouldn't tote that tent along if I was you.' "'Undreamed of!' cried Mercedes, throwing her hands in a dainty dismay. "'However in the world would I manage without a tent?' "'It's springtime, and you won't get any more cold weather,' the man replied. She shook her head decidedly, and Charles and Hal put the last odds and ends on top of the mountainous load. "'Think it'll ride?' one of the men asked. "'Why shouldn't it?' Charles demanded rather shortly. "'Oh, that's all right, that's all right,' the man hastened meekly to say. "'I was just a-wondering, that is all. It seemed a mite top-heavy.' Charles turned his back and drew the lashings down as well as he could, which was not in the least well. "'And of course the dogs can hike along all day with that contraption behind them,' affirmed the second of the men. "'Certainly,' said Hal, with freezing politeness, taking hold of the gee-pole with one hand and swinging his whip from the other. "'Mush!' he shouted. "'Mush on there!' The dogs sprang against the breastband, strained hard for a few moments, then relaxed. They were unable to move the sled. "'Lazy brutes, I'll show them!' he cried, preparing to lash out at them again with the whip. But Mercedes interfered, crying, "'Oh, Hal, you mustn't!' as she caught a hold of the whip and wrenched it from him. "'The poor dears! Now you must promise you won't be harsh with them for the rest of the trip, or I won't go a step!' "'Precious lot you know about dogs,' her brother sneered. "'And I wish you'd leave me alone. They're lazy, I tell you.' and you've got to whip them to get anything out of them. That's their way. You ask anyone. Ask one of those men. Mercedes looked at them imploringly, untold repugnance at sight of pain written in her pretty face. They're weak as water, if you want to know, came the reply from one of the men. Plum tuckered out. That's what's the matter. They need a rest. "'Rest be blanked,' said Hal, with his beardless lips, and Mercedes said, "'Oh!' in a pain and sorrow at the oath. But she was a clannish creature, and rushed at once to the defense of her brother. "'Never mind that man,' she said pointedly. "'You're driving our dogs, and you do what you think is best with them.' Again Hal's whip fell upon the dogs. They threw themselves against their breastbands, dug their feet into the packed snow, got down low to it, and put forth all their strength. The sled held as though it were an anchor. After two efforts, they stood still, panting. The whip was whistling savagely when once more Mercedes interfered. She dropped on her knees before Buck with tears in her eyes and put her arms around his neck. "'You poor, poor dears,' she cried sympathetically. "'Why don't you pull hard? Then you wouldn't be whipped.' Buck did not like her, but he was feeling too miserable to resist her, taking it as part of the day's miserable work. One of the onlookers, who had been clenching his teeth to suppress hot speech, now spoke up. "'It's not that I care a whip of what becomes of you, "'but for the dog's sakes I just want to tell you "'you can help them a mighty lot by breaking out that sled. "'The runners are froze fast. "'Throw your weight against the gee-pole right and left and break it out.' "'A third time the attempt was made, "'but this time, following the advice, "'Hal broke out the runners which had been frozen to the snow.' The overloaded and unwieldy sled forged ahead, Buck and his mates struggling frantically under the rain of blows. A hundred yards ahead, the path turned and sloped steeply into the main street. It would have required an experienced man to keep the top-heavy sled upright, and Hal was not such a man. As they swung on the turn, the sled went over, spilling half its load through the loose lashings. The dogs never stopped. The lightened sled bounced on its side behind them. 
They were angry because of the ill treatment they had received and the unjust load. Buck was raging. He broke into a run, the team following his lead. Hal cried, Whoa! Whoa! But they gave no heed. He tripped and was pulled off his feet. The capsized sled ground over him, and the dogs dashed on up the street, adding to the gaiety of Skagway as they scattered the remainder of the outfit along its cheap thoroughfare. Kind-hearted citizens caught the dogs and gathered up the scattered belongings. Also, they gave advice. Half the load and twice the dogs, if they ever expected to reach Dawson, was what they said. Hal and his sister and brother-in-law listened unwillingly, pitched tent, and overhauled the outfit. Canned goods were turned out that made men laugh, for canned goods on the long trail is a thing to dream about. "'Blankets for a hotel,' quoth one of the men who laughed and helped. "'Half as many is too much. Get rid of them. Throw away that tent and all those dishes. Who's going to wash them anyway? Good Lord, do you think you're traveling on a pullman?' And so it went, the inexorable elimination of the superfluous. Mercedes cried when her clothes bags were dumped on the ground and article after article was thrown out. She cried in general, and she cried in particular over each discarded thing. She clasped hands about knees, rocking back and forth brokenheartedly. She averred that she would not go an inch, not for a dozen Charleses. She appealed to everybody and to everything, finally wiping her eyes and proceeding to cast out even articles of apparel that were imperative necessaries. And, in her zeal, when she had finished with her own, she attacked the belongings of her men and went through them like a tornado. This accomplished, the outfit, though cut in half, was still a formidable bulk. Charles and Hal went out in the evening and bought six outside dogs. These, added to the six of the original team, and Teak and Kuna, the huskies obtained at the Rink Rapids on the record trip, brought the team up to fourteen. But the outside dogs, though particularly broken in since their landing, did not amount to much. These were short-haired pointers. One was a Newfoundland, and the other two were mongrels of indeterminate breed. They did not seem to know anything, these newcomers, Buck and his comrades looked upon them with disgust, and though he speedily taught them their places and what not to do, he could not teach them what to do. They did not take kindly to trace and trail. With the exception of the two mongrels, they were bewildered and spirit-broken by the strange, savage environment in which they found themselves, and by the ill treatment they had received. The two mongrels were without spirit at all bones were the only things breakable about them. With the newcomers hopeless and forlorn, and the old team worn out by 2,500 miles of continuous trail, the outlook was anything but bright. The two men, however, were quite cheerful, and they were proud, too. They were doing the thing in style with 14 dogs. They had seen other sleds depart over the pass for Dawson, or come in from Dawson, but never had they seen a sled with so many as fourteen dogs. In the nature of Arctic travel, there was a reason why fourteen dogs should not drag one sled, and that was that one sled could not carry the food for fourteen dogs. But Charles and Hal did not know this. They had worked the trip out with a pencil. So much to a dog, so many dogs, so many days, Q.E.D. Mercedes looked over their shoulders and nodded comprehensively. It was all so very simple. Late next morning, Buck led the long team up the street. There was nothing lively about it. No snap or go in him and his fellows. They were starting dead weary. Four times he had covered the distance between Saltwater and Dawson, and the knowledge that, jaded and tired, he was facing the same trail once more, made him bitter. His heart was not in the work, nor was the heart of any dog. The outsides were timid and frightened, the insides without confidence in their masters. Buck felt vaguely that there was no depending upon these two men and the woman. They did not know how to do anything, and as the days went by it became apparent that they could not learn. They were slack in all things, without order or discipline. It took them half the night to pitch a slovenly camp, 
and half the morning to break that camp and get the sled loaded in a fashion so slovenly that for the rest of the day they were occupied in stopping and rearranging the load. Some days they did not make ten miles. On other days they were unable to get started at all. And on no day did they succeed in making more than half the distance used by the men as a basis in their dog-food computation. It was inevitable that they should go short on dog-food, but they hastened it by overfeeding, bringing the day nearer when the underfeeding would commence. The outside dogs, whose digestions had not been trained by chronic famine to make the most of little, had voracious appetites, and when, in addition to this, the worn-out huskies pulled weakly, Hal decided that the orthodox ration was too small. He doubled it, and to cap it all, when Mercedes, with tears in her pretty eyes and a quaver in her throat, could not cajole him into giving the dogs still more, she stole from the fish sacks and fed them slyly. But it was not food that Buck and the huskies needed, but rest, and though they were making poor time, the heavy load they dragged sapped their strength severely. Then came the underfeeding. Hal awoke one day to the fact that his dog food was half gone, and the distance only a quarter covered. Further, that for love or money no additional dog food was to be obtained. So he cut down even the orthodox ration and tried to increase the day's travel. His sister and brother-in-law seconded him, but they were frustrated by their heavy outfit and their own incompetence. It was a simple matter to give the dogs less food, but it was impossible to make the dogs travel faster, while their own inability to get under way earlier in the morning prevented them from traveling longer hours. Not only did they not know how to work dogs, but they did not know how to work themselves. The first to go was Dub, poor blundering thief that he was, always getting caught and punished. He had none the less been a faithful worker. His wrenched shoulder blade, untreated and unrested, went from bad to worse, till finally Hal shot him with the big Colt's revolver. It is a saying of the country that an outside dog starves to death on the ration of the husky, so the six outside dogs under Buck would do no less than die on half the ration of the husky. The Newfoundland went first, followed by the three short-haired pointers and the two mongrels hanging more grittily on to life, but going in the end. By this time all the amenities and gentleness of the Southland had fallen away from the three people. Shorn of its glamour and romance, Arctic travel became to them a reality too harsh for their manhood and womanhood. Mercedes ceased weeping over the dogs, being too occupied with weeping over herself and with quarrelling with her husband and brother. To quarrel was the one thing they were never too weary to do. Their irritability arose out of their misery, increased with it, doubled upon it, outdistanced it. The wonderful patience of the trail which comes to men who toil hard and suffer sore, and remain sweet of speech and kindly, did not come to these two men and the woman. They had no inkling of such patience. They were stiff and in pain, their muscles ached, their bones ached, their very hearts ached, and because of this they became sharp of speech, and hard words were first on their lips in the morning and last at night. Charles and Hal wrangled whenever Mercedes gave them a chance. It was the cherished belief of each that he did more than his share of the work, and neither forbore to speak this belief at every opportunity. Sometimes Mercedes sided with her husband, sometimes with her brother. The result was a beautiful and unending family quarrel. Starting from a dispute as to which should chop a few sticks for the fire, a dispute which concerned only Charles and Hal, presently would be lugged in the rest of the family, fathers, mothers, uncles, cousins, people thousands of miles away, and some of them dead. That Hal's views on art, or the sort of society plays his mother's brother wrote, would have anything to do with chopping a few sticks of firewood, passes comprehension. Nevertheless, the quarrel was as likely to tend in that direction as in the direction of Charles' political prejudices. And that Charles's sister's tale-bearing tongue should be relevant to the building of a Yukon fire was apparent only to Mercedes, who disburdened herself of copious opinions upon that topic, and incidentally upon a few other traits unpleasantly peculiar to her husband's family. 
In the meantime, the fire remained unbuilt, the camp half-pitched, and the dogs unfed. Mercedes nursed a special grievance, the grievance of sex. She was pretty and soft, and had been chivalrously treated all her days. But the present treatment by her husband and brother was everything save chivalrous. It was her custom to be helpless, they complained, upon which impeachment of what to her was her most essential sex prerogative, she made their lives unendurable. She no longer considered the dogs, and because she was sore and tired, she persisted in riding on the sled. She was pretty and soft, but she weighed one hundred and twenty pounds, a lusty last straw to the load dragged by the weak and starving animals. She rode for days till they fell in the traces, and the sled stood still. Charles and Hal begged her to get off and walk, pleaded with her, entreated, the while she wept and importuned heaven with a recital of their brutality. On one occasion they took her off the sled by main strength. They never did it again. She let her legs go limp like a spoiled child and sat down on the trail. They went on their way, but she did not move. After they had traveled three miles, they unloaded the sled, came back for her, and by main strength put her on the sled again. In the excess of their own misery, they were callous to the suffering of their animals. Hal's theory, which he practiced on others, was that one mustn't get hardened. He had started out preaching it to his sister and brother-in-law. Failing there, he hammered it into the dogs with a club. At the five fingers, the dog food gave out, and a toothless old squaw offered to trade them a few pounds of frozen horsehide for the colt's revolver that kept the big hunting knife company at Hal's hip. A poor substitute for the food was this hide, just as it had been stripped from the starved horses of the cattlemen six months back. In its frozen state, it was more like strips of galvanized iron, and when a dog wrestled it into his stomach, it thawed into thin and innutritious leathery strings, and into mass of short hair, irritating and indigestible. And through it all, Buck staggered along at the head of the team, as in a nightmare. He pulled when he could, when he could no longer pull, he fell down and remained down till blows from whip or club drove him to his feet again. All the stiffness and gloss had gone out of his beautiful furry coat. The hair hung down, limp and draggled, or matted with dried blood where Hal's club had bruised him. His muscles had wasted away to knotty strings, and the flesh pads had disappeared so that each rib and every bone in his frame were outlined cleanly through the loose hide that was wrinkled in folds of emptiness. It was heartbreaking. Only Buck's heart was unbreakable. The man in the red sweater had proved that. As it was with Buck, so it was with his mates. They were perambulating skeletons. There were seven altogether, including him. In their very great misery they had become insensible to the bite of the lash or the bruise of the club. The pain of the beating was dull and distant, just as the things their eyes saw and their ears heard seemed dull and distant. They were not half-living or quarter-living, they were simply so many bags of bones in which sparks of life fluttered faintly. When a halt was made, they dropped down in the traces like dead dogs, and the spark dimmed and paled and seemed to go out. But when the club or whip fell upon them, the spark fluttered feebly up, and they tottered to their feet and staggered on. There came a day when Billy, the good-natured, fell and could not rise. Hal had traded off his revolver, so he took the axe and knocked Billy on the head as he lay in the traces then cut the carcass out of the harness and dragged it to one side. Buck saw, and his mate saw, and they knew that this thing was very close to them. And on the next day Kuna went, and but five of them remained. Joe, too far gone to be malignant, Pike, crimped and limping, only half conscious and not conscious enough longer to malinger, Sol Lex the one-eyed, still faithful to the toil and trace and trail, and mournful in that he had so little strength with which to pull. Teak, who had not traveled so far that winter, and who was now beaten more than the others because he was fresher, and Buck, still at the head of the team, but no longer enforcing discipline or striving to enforce it, 
blind with weakness half the time and keeping the trail by the loom of it and by the dim feel of his feet. It was beautiful spring weather, but neither dogs nor humans were aware of it. Each day the sun rose earlier and set later. It was dawn by three in the morning, and twilight lingered till nine at night. The whole long day was a blaze of sunshine. The ghostly winter silence had given way to the great spring murmur of awakening life. This murmur arose from all the land, fraught with the joy of living. It came from the things that lived and moved again, things which had been dead and which had not moved during the long months of frost. The sap was rising in the pines. The willows and aspens were bursting out in young buds. Shrubs and vines were putting on fresh garbs of green. Crickets sang in the nights, and in the days all manner of creeping, crawling things rustled forth into the sun. Partridges and woodpeckers were booming and knocking in the forest. Squirrels were chattering, birds singing, and overhead honked the wild fowl driving up from the south in cunning wedges that split the air. From every hill slope came the trickle of running water, the music of unseen fountains. All things were thawing, bending, snapping. The Yukon was straining to break loose the ice that had bound it down. It ate away from beneath. The sun ate from above. Air holes formed. Fissures sprang and spread apart, while thin sections of ice fell through bodily into the river. And amid all this bursting, rending, throbbing of awakening life, under the blazing sun and through the soft, sighing breezes, like wayfarers to death, staggered the two men, the woman, and the huskies. With the dogs falling, Mercedes weeping and riding, Hal swearing innocuously, and Charles' eyes wistfully watering, they staggered into John Thornton's camp at the mouth of White River. When they halted, the dogs dropped down as though they had all been struck dead. Mercedes dried her eyes and looked at John Thornton. Charles sat down on a log to rest. He sat down very slowly and painstakingly, what of his great stiffness. Hal did the talking. John Thornton was whittling the last touches on an axe handle he had made from a stick of birch. He whittled and listened and gave monosyllabic replies, and, when it was asked, terse advice. He knew the breed, and he gave his advice in the certainty that it would not be followed. They told us up above that the bottom was dropping out of the trail and that the best thing for us to do is lay over, Hal said in response to Thornton's warning to take no more chances on the rotten ice. They told us we couldn't make White River, and here we are. This last with a sneering ring of triumph in it. And they told you true, John Thornton answered. The bottom's likely to drop out at any moment. Only fools, with the blind luck of fools, could have made it. I tell you straight, I wouldn't risk my carcass on that ice for all the gold in Alaska. That's because you're not a fool, I suppose, said Hal. All the same, we'll go on to Dawson. He uncoiled his whip. Get up there, Buck. Hi! Get up there. Mush on! Thornton went on whittling. It was idle, he knew, to get between a fool and his folly, while two or three fools more or less would not alter the scheme of things. But the team did not get up at the command. It had long since passed into the stage where blows were required to rouse it. The whip flashed out here and there on its merciless errands. John Thornton compressed his lips. Sol Lex was the first to crawl to his feet. Teak followed. Joe came next, yelping with pain. Pike made painful efforts. Twice he fell over. When half up, and on the third attempt, he managed to rise. Buck made no effort. He lay quietly where he had fallen. The lash bit into him again and again. But he neither whined nor struggled. Several times Thornton started as though to speak, but changed his mind. A moisture came into his eyes, and, as the whipping continued, he arose and walked irresolutely up and down. This was the first time Buck had failed, in itself a sufficient reason to drive Hal into a rage. He exchanged the whip for the customary club. Buck refused to move under the rain of heavier blows which now fell upon him. Like his mates, he, barely able to get up, but unlike them, he had made up his mind not to get up. He had a vague feeling of impending doom. This had been strong upon him when he pulled into the bank, and it had not departed from him. 
What of the thin and rotten ice he had felt under his feet all day? It seemed that he sensed disaster close at hand, out there ahead on the ice where his master was trying to drive him. He refused to stir. So greatly had he suffered, and so far gone was he, that the blows did not hurt much, and they continued to fall upon him. The spark of life within flickered and went down. It was nearly out. He felt strangely numb, as though from a great distance he was aware that he was being beaten. The last sensations of pain left him. He no longer felt anything though very faintly he could hear the impact of the club upon his body, but it was no longer his body. It seemed so far away. And then, suddenly, without warning, uttering a cry that was inarticulate and more like the cry of an animal, John Thornton sprang upon the man who wielded the club. Hal was hurled backward, as though struck by a failing tree. Mercedes screamed. Charles looked on wistfully, wiped his watery eyes, but did not get up because of his stiffness. John Thornton stood over Buck, struggling to control himself, too convulsed with rage to speak. "'If you strike that dog again, I'll kill you,' he at last managed to say in a choking voice. "'It's my dog,' Hal replied, wiping the blood from his mouth as he came back. "'Get out of my way or I'll fix you. I'm going to Dawson.' Thornton stood between him and Buck, and evinced no intention of getting out of the way. Hal drew his long hunting knife. Mercedes screamed, cried, laughed, and manifested the chaotic abandonment of hysteria. Thornton wrapped Hal's knuckles with the axe handle, knocking the knife to the ground. He wrapped his knuckles again as he tried to pick it up. Then he stooped, picked it up himself, and with two strokes cut Buck's traces. Hal had no fight left in him. Besides, his hands were full with his sister, or his arms, rather, while Buck was too near dead to be of further use in hauling the sled. A few minutes later, they pulled out from the bank and down the river. Buck heard them go and raised his head to see. Pike was leading, Sol Lex was at the wheel, and between were Joe and Teak. They were limping and staggering. Mercedes was riding the loaded sled. Hal guided at the gee-pole and Charles stumbled along in the rear. As Buck watched them, Thornton knelt beside him and with rough, kindly hands searched for broken bones. By the time his search had disclosed nothing more than many bruises and a state of terrible starvation, the sled was a quarter of a mile away. Dog and man watched it crawling along over the ice. Suddenly they saw its back end drop down as into a rut, and the gee pole, with Hal clinging to it, jerked into the air. Mercedes's scream came to their ears. They saw Charles turn and make one step to run back and then a whole section of ice give way and the dogs and humans disappear. A yawning hole was all that was to be seen. The bottom had dropped out of the trail. John Thornton and Buck looked at each other. You poor devil, said John Thornton, and Buck licked his hand. Chapter 6. For the Love of a Man When John Thornton froze his feet in the previous December, his partners had made him comfortable and left him to get well, going on themselves up the river to get out a raft of saw logs for Dawson. He was still limping slightly at the time he rescued Buck, but with the continued warm weather even the slight limp left him. And here, lying by the river bank, through the long spring days, watching the running water, Listening lazily to the songs of birds and the hum of nature, Buck slowly won back his strength. A rest comes very good after one has traveled three thousand miles, and it must be confessed that Buck waxed lazy as his wounds healed, his muscles swelled out, and the flesh came back to cover his bones. For that matter, they were all loafing, Buck, John Thornton, and Skeet, and Nig, waiting for the raft to come that was to carry them down to Dawson. Skeet was a little Irish setter who early made friends with Buck, who, in a dying condition, was unable to resent her first advances. She had the doctor trait which some dogs possess, and as a mother cat washes her kittens, so she washed and cleansed Buck's wounds. Regularly each morning, after he had finished his breakfast, she performed her self-appointed task, until he came to look for her ministrations as much as he did for Thornton's. Nig, 
equally friendly, though less demonstrative, was a huge black dog, half bloodhound and half deerhound, with eyes that laughed and a boundless good nature. To Buck's surprise, these dogs manifested no jealousy toward him. They seemed to share the kindliness and largeness of John Thornton. As Buck grew stronger, they enticed him into all sorts of ridiculous games, in which Thornton himself could not forbear to join, and in this fashion Buck romped through his convalescence and into a new existence. Love, genuine, passionate love, was his for the first time. This he had never experienced at Judge Miller's down in the sun-kissed Santa Clara Valley. With the judge's sons, hunting and tramping, it had been a working partnership, with the judge's grandsons a sort of pompous guardianship, and with the judge himself a stately and dignified friendship. But love that was feverish and burning, that was adoration, that was madness, it had taken John Thornton to arouse. This man had saved his life, which was something, but further he was the ideal master. Other men saw to the welfare of their dogs from a sense of duty and business expediency, he saw to the welfare of his as if they were his own children, because he could not help it, and he saw further. He never forgot a kindly greeting or a cheering word, and to sit down for a long talk with them, gas, as he called it, was as much his delight as theirs. He had a way of taking Buck's head roughly between his hands and resting his own head upon Buck's, of shaking him back and forth, the while calling him ill names that to Buck were love names. Buck knew no greater joy than that rough embrace and the sound of murmured oaths, and at each jerk back and forth it seemed that his heart would be shaken out of his body, so great was its ecstasy. And when released he sprang to his feet, his mouth laughing, his eyes eloquent, his throat vibrant with unuttered sound, and in that fashion remained without movement, John Thornton would reverently exclaim, God, you can all but speak. Buck had a trick of love expression that was akin to hurt. He would often seize Thornton's hand in his mouth and close so fiercely that the flesh bore the impress of his teeth for some time afterward, and Buck understood the oaths to be love words, so the man understood this feigned bite for a caress. For the most part, however, Buck's love was expressed in adoration. While he went wild with happiness when Thornton touched him or spoke to him, he did not seek these tokens. Unlike Skeet, who was wont to shove her nose under Thornton's hand and nudge and nudge until petted, or Nig, who would stalk up and rest his great head on Thornton's knee, Buck was content to adore at a distance. He would lie by the hour, eager, alert, at Thornton's feet, looking up into his face, dwelling upon it, studying it, following it with keenest interest, each fleeting expression, every movement or change of feature. Or, as chance might have it, he would lie farther away, to the side or rear, watching the outlines of the man and the occasional movements of his body, and often such was the communion in which they lived, the strength of Buck's gaze would draw John Thornton's head around, and he would return the gaze, without speech, his heart shining out of his eyes as Buck's heart shone out. For a long time after his rescue, Buck did not like Thornton to get out of his sight. From the moment he left the tent to when he entered it again, Buck would follow at his heels. His transient masters, since he had come into the Northland, had bred in him a fear that no master could be permanent. He was afraid that Thornton would pass out of his life as Perrault and Francois and the Scotch half-breed had passed out. Even in the night, in his dreams, he was haunted by this fear. At such times he would shake off sleep and creep through the chill of the flap of the tent where he could stand and listen to the sound of his master's breathing. But in spite of this great love he bore John Thornton, which seemed to bespeak the soft, civilizing influence, the strain of the primitive, which the Northland had aroused in him, remained alive and active. Faithfulness and devotion, things born of fire and roof, were his, yet he retained his wildness and wiliness. He was a thing of the wild, come in from the wild, to sit by John Thornton's fire, rather than a dog of the soft Southland, stamped with the marks of generations of civilization. Because of his very great love, he could not steal from this man, 
but from any other man in any other camp he did not hesitate an instant, while the cunning with which he stole enabled him to escape detection. His face and body were scored by the teeth of many dogs, and he fought as fiercely as ever and more shrewdly. Skeet and Nig were too good-natured for quarreling. Besides, they belonged to John Thornton. But the strange dog, no matter what the breed or valor, swiftly acknowledged Buck's supremacy, or found himself struggling for life with a terrible antagonist. And Buck was merciless. He had learned well the law of club and fang, and he never forewent an advantage or drew back from a foe he had started on the way to death. He had lessened from Spitz and from the chief fighting dogs of the police and mail, and he knew there was no middle course. He must master or be mastered, while to show mercy was a weakness. Mercy did not exist in the primordial life. It was misunderstood for fear, and such misunderstandings made for death. Kill or be killed, eat or be eaten, was the law. And this mandate, down out of the depths of time, he obeyed. He was older than the days he had seen and the breaths he had drawn. He linked the past with the present, and the eternity behind him throbbed through him in a mighty rhythm to which he swayed as the tides and seasons swayed. He sat by John Thornton's fire, a broad-breasted dog, white-fanged and long-furred, but behind him were the shades of all manner of dogs, half-wolves and wild wolves, urgent and prompting, tasting the savor of the meat he ate, thirsting for the water he drank, scenting the wind with him, listening with him and telling him the sounds made by the wild life in the forest, dictating his moods, directing his actions, lying down to sleep with him when he lay down, and dreaming with him beyond him and becoming themselves the stuff of his dreams. So peremptorily did these shades beckon him that each day mankind and the claims of mankind slipped farther from him. Deep in the forest a call was sounding, and as often as he heard this call, mysteriously thrilling and luring, he felt compelled to turn his back upon the fire and the beaten earth around it, and to plunge into the forest, and on and on, he knew not where or why, nor did he wonder where or why, the call sounding imperiously, deep in the forest. But as often as he gained the soft, unbroken earth and the green shade, the love for John Thornton drew him back to the fire again. Thornton alone held him. The rest of mankind was as nothing. Chance travelers might praise or pet him, but he was cold under it all, and from a too demonstrative man he would get up and walk away. When Thornton's partners, Hans and Pete, arrived on the long-expected raft, Buck refused to notice them until he learned they were close to Thornton. After that he tolerated them in a passive sort of way, accepting favors from them as though he favored them by accepting. They were of the same large type as Thornton, living close to the earth, thinking simply and seeing clearly, and ere they swung the raft into the big eddy by the sawmill at Dawson, they understood Buck and his ways, and did not insist upon an intimacy such as obtained with Skeet and Nig. For Thornton, however, his love seemed to grow and grow. He alone among men could put a pack upon Buck's back in the summer traveling. Nothing was too great for Buck to do when Thornton commanded. One day they had grub-staked themselves from the proceeds of the raft and left Dawson for the headwaters of the Tanana. The men and dogs were sitting on the crest of a cliff which fell away straight down to naked bedrock three hundred feet below. John Thornton was sitting near the edge, Buck at his shoulder. A thoughtless whim seized Thornton, and he drew the attention of Hans and Pete to the experiment he had in mind. "'Jump, Buck!' he commanded, sweeping his arm out over the chasm. The next instant he was grappling with Buck on the extreme edge while Hans and Pete were dragging them back into safety. "'It's uncanny,' Pete said, after it was over and they had caught their speech. Thornton shook his head. "'No, it is splendid and it is terrible, too. Do you know it, it sometimes makes me afraid?' "'I'm not hankering to be the man that lays hands on you while he's around,' Pete announced conclusively, nodding his head toward Buck. Pie jingo was Hans' contribution. Not myself either. It was at Circle City, ere the year was out, that Pete's apprehensions were realized. 
Black Burton, a man evil-tempered and malicious, had been picking a quarrel with the tenderfoot at the bar when Thornton stepped good-naturedly between. Buck, as was his custom, was lying in a corner, head on paws, watching his master's every action. Burton struck out, without warning, straight from the shoulder. Thornton was sent spinning and saved himself from falling only by clutching the rail of the bar. Those who were looking on heard what was neither a bark nor a yelp, but something which is best described as a roar, and they saw Buck's body rise up in the air as he left the floor for Burton's throat. The man saved his life by instinctively throwing out his arm, but was hurled backward to the floor with Buck on top of him. Buck loosed his teeth from the flesh of the arm and drove again for the throat. This time the man succeeded only in partly blocking, and his throat was torn open. Then the crowd was upon Buck, and he was driven off, but while a surgeon checked the bleeding, he prowled up and down, growling furiously, attempting to rush in, and being forced back by an array of hostile clubs. A miners' meeting, called on the spot, decided that the dog had sufficient provocation, and Buck was discharged, but his reputation was made, and from that day his name spread through every camp in Alaska. Later on, in the fall of the year, he saved John Thornton's life in quite another fashion. The three partners were lining a long and narrow poling boat down a bad stretch of rapids on the Forty Mile Creek. Hans and Pete moved along the bank, snubbing with a thin manila rope from tree to tree, while Thornton remained in the boat, helping its descent by means of a pole and shouting directions to the shore. Buck, on the bank, worried and anxious, kept abreast of the boat, his eyes never off his master. At a particularly bad spot, where a ledge of barely submerged rocks jutted out into the river, Hans cast off the rope and, while Thornton pulled the boat out into the stream, ran down the bank with the end of his hand to snub the boat when it had cleared the ledge. This it did, and was flying downstream in a current as swift as a mill race, when Hans checked it with the rope, and checked too suddenly. The boat flirted over and snubbed into the bank bottom up, while Thornton, flung sheer out of it, was carried downstream toward the worst part of the rapids, a stretch of wild water in which no swimmer could live. Buck had sprung in on the instant, and at the end of three hundred yards, amid a mad swirl of water, he overhauled Thornton. When he felt him grasp his tail, Buck headed for the bank, swimming with all his splendid strength. But the progress shoreward was slow the progress downstream amazingly rapid. From below came the fatal roaring where the wild current went wilder and was rent in shreds and spray by the rocks which thrust through like the teeth of an enormous comb. The suck of the water as it took the beginning of the last steep pitch was frightful, and Thornton knew that the shore was impossible. He scraped furiously over a rock, bruised across a second, and struck a third with a crushing force. He clutched its slippery top with both hands, releasing Buck, and above the roar of the churning water shouted, Go, Buck! Go! Buck could not hold his own, and swept on downstream, struggling desperately but unable to win back. When he heard Thornton's command repeated, he partly reared out of the water, throwing his head high as though for a last look, then turned obediently toward the bank. He swam powerfully and was dragged ashore by Pete and Hans at the very point where swimming ceased to be possible and destruction began. They knew that the time a man could cling to a slippery rock in the face of that driving current was a matter of minutes, and they ran as fast as they could up the bank to the point far above where Thornton was hanging on. They attached the line with which they had been snubbing the boat to Buck's neck and shoulders, being careful that it should neither strangle him nor impede his swimming, and launched him into the stream. He struck out boldly, but not straight enough into the stream. He discovered the mistake too late, when Thornton was abreast of him and a bare half-dozen strokes away, while he was being carried helplessly past. Hans promptly snubbed with the rope, as though Buck were a boat. The rope, thus tightening on him in the sweep of the current, he was jerked under the surface, and under the surface he remained till his body struck against the bank, and he was hauled out. He was half drowned, and Hans and Pete threw themselves upon him, pounding the breath into him and the water out of him. He staggered to his feet and fell down. The faint sound of Thornton's voice came to them, and though they could not make out the words of it, they knew that he was in his extremity. His master's voice acted on Buck like an electric shock. He sprang to his feet, 
and ran up the bank ahead of the men to the point of his previous departure. Again the rope was attached, and he was launched, and again he struck out, but this time straight into the stream. He had miscalculated once, but he would not be guilty of it a second time. Hans paid out the rope, permitting no slack, while Pete kept it clear of coils. Buck held on till he was on line straight above Thornton, and then he turned, and with the speed of an express train headed down upon him. Thornton saw him coming, and as Buck struck him like a battering ram, with the whole force of the current behind him, he reached up and closed with both arms around the shaggy neck. Hans snubbed the rope around the tree, and Buck and Thornton were jerked under water. Strangling, suffocating, sometimes one uppermost and sometimes the other, dragging over the jagged bottom, smashing against rocks and snags, they veered into the bank. Thornton came to, belly downward, and being violently propelled back and forth across a drift log by Hans and Pete. His first glance was for Buck, over whose limp and apparently lifeless body Nig was setting up a howl, while Skeet was licking the wet face and closed eyes. Thornton was himself bruised and battered, and he went carefully over Buck's body, when he had been brought around, finding three broken ribs. "'That settles it,' he announced. "'We camp right here.' and camp they did, till Buck's ribs knitted and he was able to travel. That winter at Dawson, Buck performed another exploit, not so heroic, perhaps, but one that put his name many notches higher on the totem pole of Alaskan fame. This exploit was particularly gratifying to the three men, for they stood in need of the outfit which it furnished, and were enabled to make a long-desired trip into the virgin east, where miners had not yet appeared. It was brought about by a conversation in the El Dorado saloon, in which men waxed boastful of their favorite dogs. Buck, because of his record, was the target for these men, and Thornton was driven stoutly to defend him. At the end of half an hour, one man stated that his dog could start a sled with five hundred pounds and walk off with it. A second bragged six hundred for his dog, and a third seven hundred. Pooh, pooh! said John Thornton. Buck can start a thousand pounds. And break it out? And walk off with it for a hundred yards? demanded Mathewson, a Bonanza King, he of seven hundred vaunt. And break it out, and walk off with it for a hundred yards, John Thornton said coolly. Well, Mathewson said slowly and deliberately, so that all could hear, I've got a thousand dollars that says he can't. And there it is. So saying, he slammed a sack of gold dust of the size of a bologna sandwich down upon the bar. Nobody spoke. Thornton's bluff, if, if bluff it was, had been called. He could feel a flush of warm blood creeping up his face. His tongue had tricked him. He did not know whether Buck could start a thousand pounds, half a ton. The enormousness of it appalled him. He had great faith in Buck's strength and had often thought him capable of starting such a load, but never, as now, had he faced the possibility of it. The eyes of a dozen men fixed upon him, silent and waiting. Further, he had no thousand dollars, nor Hans, or Pete. "'I've got a sled standing outside now with twenty fifty-pound sacks of flour on it,' Matthewson went on with brutal directness. "'So don't let that hinder you.' Thornton did not reply. He did not know what to say. He glanced from face to face in the absent way of a man who has lost the power of thought and is seeking somewhere to find the thing that will start it going again. The face of Jim O'Brien, a mastodon king, an old-time comrade, caught his eyes. It was a cue to him, seeming to rouse him to do what he would never have dreamed of doing. "'Can you lend me a thousand? he asked, almost in a whisper. "Sure." O'Brien answered, thumping down a plethoric sack by the side of Matthewson's. Though it's little faith I'm having, John, that's a beast can do the trick. The Eldorado emptied its occupants into the street to see the test. The tables were deserted, and the dealers and gamekeepers came forth to see the outcome of the wager and to lay odds. Several hundred men, furred and mittened, banked around the sled with easy distance. Matthewson's sled, loaded with a thousand pounds of flour, had been standing for a couple of hours, and in the intense cold, it was sixty below zero, 
the runners had frozen fast to the hard-packed snow. Men offered odds of two to one that Buck could not budge the sled. A quibble arose concerning the phase break out. O'Brien contended it was Thornton's privilege to knock the runners loose, leaving Buck to break it out from a dead standstill. Matthewson insisted that the phrase included breaking the runners from the frozen grip of the snow. A majority of the men who had witnessed the making of the bet decided in his favor, whereat the odds went up to three to one against Buck. There were no takers. Not a man believed him capable of the feat. Thornton had been hurried into the wager, heavy with doubt, and now that he looked at the sled itself, the concrete fact, with the regular team of ten dogs curled up in the snow before it, the more impossible the task appeared. Matthewson waxed jubilant. Three to one, he proclaimed. I'll lay you another thousand at that figure, Thornton. What do you say? Thornton's doubt was strong in his face, but his fighting spirit was aroused, the fighting spirit that soars above odds, fails to recognize the impossible, and is deaf to all save the clamor for battle. He called Hans and Pete to him. Their sacks were slim, and with his own the three partners could rake together only two hundred dollars. In the ebb of their fortunes this sum was their total capital, yet they laid it unhesitatingly against Matthewson's six hundred. The team of ten dogs was unhitched, and Buck, with his own harness, was put into the sled. He had caught the contagion of the excitement, and he felt that in some way he must do a great thing for John Thornton. Murmurs of admiration at his splendid appearance went up. He was in perfect condition, without an ounce of superfluous flesh, and the one hundred fifty pounds that he weighed were so many pounds of grit and virility. His furry coat shone with the sheen of silk. Down the neck and across the shoulders his mane, in repose as it was, half bristled, and seemed to lift with every movement, as though excess of vigor made each particular hair alive and active. The great breast and heavy forelegs were no more than in proportion with the rest of his body, where the muscles showed in tight rolls underneath the skin. Men felt these muscles, and proclaimed them hard as iron, and the odds went down to two to one. "'Gad, sir! Gad, sir!' stuttered a member of the latest dynasty, a king of the Skookum benches. "'I offer you eight hundred for him, sir, before the test, sir, eight hundred, just as he stands.' Thornton shook his head and stepped to Buck's side. "'You must stand off from him,' Matthewson protested. "'Free play and plenty of room.' The crowd fell silent. Only could be heard the voices of the gamblers vainly offering two to one. Everybody acknowledged Buck, a magnificent animal, but twenty fifty-pound sacks of flour bulked too large in their eyes for them to loosen their pouch-strings. Thornton knelt down by Buck's side. He took his head in his two hands and rested cheek on cheek. He did not playfully shake him, as was his wont, or murmur soft love curses, but he whispered in his ear, "'As you love me, Buck, as you love me,' was what he whispered. Buck whined with suppressed eagerness. The crowd was watching curiously. The affair was growing mysterious. It seemed like a conjuration. As Thornton got to his feet, Buck seized his mittened hand between his jaws, pressing in with his teeth and releasing slowly, half-reluctantly. It was the answer in terms, not of speech, but of love. Thornton stepped well back. "'Now, Buck,' he said. Buck tightened the traces, then slacked them for a matter of several inches. It was the way he had learned. "'Gee!' Thornton's voice rang out, sharp in the tense silence. Buck swung to the right, ending the movement in a plunge that took up the slack, and with sudden jerk arrested his one hundred and fifty pounds. The load quivered, and from under the runners arose a crisp crackling. Ha! Thornton commanded. Buck duplicated the maneuver, this time to the left. The crackling turned into a snapping, and the sled pivoting, and the runners slipping, and grating several inches to the side. The sled was broken out. Men were holding their breaths, intensely unconscious of the fact. Now! Mush! Thornton's command cracked out like a pistol shot. Buck threw himself forward, 
tightening the traces with a jarring lunge. His whole body was gathered compactly together in the tremendous effort, the muscles writhing and knotting like live things under the silky fur. His great chest was low to the ground, his head forward and down, while his feet were flying like mad, the claws scarring the hard-packed snow in parallel grooves. The sled swayed and trembled, half started forward. One of his feet slipped, and one man groaned aloud. Then the sled lurched ahead in what appeared a rapid succession of jerks, though it never really came to a dead stop again, half an inch, an inch, two inches. The jerks perceptibly diminished as the sled gained momentum. He caught them up till it was moving steadily along. Men gasped and began to breathe again, unaware for a moment that they had ceased to breathe. Thornton was running behind, encouraging Buck with short, cheery words. The distance had been measured off, and as he neared the pile of firewood which marked the end of the hundred yards, a cheer began to grow and grow, which burst into a roar as he passed the firewood and halted at command. Every man was tearing himself loose, even Mathewson. Hats and mittens were flying in the air. Men were shaking hands. It did not matter with whom, and bubbling over in general incoherent babble. But Thornton fell on his knees beside Buck. Head was against head, and he was shaking him back and forth. Those who hurried up heard him cursing Buck, and he cursed him long and fervently and softly and lovingly. "'Gad, sir! Gad, sir!' sputtered the Skookum Bench King. "'I'll give you a thousand for him, sir! A thousand, sir! Twelve hundred, sir!' Thornton rose to his feet. His eyes were wet. The tears were streaming frankly down his cheeks. Sir, he said to the Skookum Bench King, no, sir, you can go to hell, sir. It's the best I can do for you, sir. Buck seized Thornton's hand in his teeth. Thornton shook him back and forth. As though animated by a common impulse, the onlookers drew back to a respectful distance, nor were they again indiscreet enough to interrupt. This concludes Chapters 5 and 6 of The Call of the Wild by Jack London, as read by Jean O'Sullivan, for LibriVox.